really weird kick setup. And if any of you guys have had any, had any experience with some of the British bikes, the high compression overhead valve stuff, they've got a compression release that you pull when you kick start the bike. And the way we crank it up is compression release is right here, it actually lifts the exhaust valves. And you kind of give it like a three kicks to get that engine spun up to some amount of speed and drop the compression release and it should fire right up, so. The Traub motorcycle has been here in our collection since 1997. It's got a great lineage known about it from 1967 on and it's got owners like Bud Eakins did stunts for all sorts of Hollywood movies. Steve McQueen owned the bike for a couple years. Uh, Steve sold it back to Bud. Bud sold it to a guy named Richard Morris again, and Richard is the fellow that sold it to my dad, and that would have been in 1997. Now, from 67 all the way to 1980-something, the bike never ran at all, and Richard was the first fella to get it running. Now, the bike is far ahead of its time, but it's not without its kind of shortfalls. So there were a few things that Richard had to correct or update in the engine, and then uh, uh, probably rode it 2,000 plus miles. So really uh, dependable, reliable, honk down the road at probably 55, 60 all day, top speed around 80 miles an hour. So the neat thing about this machine as far as its origin is that, that from 1967 until now, nothing's been known about it or very little's been known, uh, not enough to formulate a story of who actually built it. And what happens is we've probably had, she's about a million and a half visitors through here in the past 20 years and we'll get a group just like this together and we'll kind of talk about the bike and you know, highlight the mystery that kind of revolves around the bike's creation. And what happens is somebody in, in the, the group will get passionate about it and go home and do a little research and find something and send it to us. So over the past 20 years, uh, all of the really pertinent pieces of information that have come to us have come from visitor research, which is really, really cool. Um, so to the point where we've got about eight or nine pieces that actually have helped us formulate uh, or figure the story of who built it. There's a whole book full of stuff. If you guys get a chance, really neat deal. There's actually a full uh, photo set of the rebuild of the engine here. And when we got the bike, it was a run and motorcycle. But when you deal with something of this sort of rarity, you want to go through it and you want to make sure that it's mechanically perfect or as perfect as perfect can be. The only one ever known of. Only one ever known, that's right. Now, there's a, this is one of the really neat things. This is a photo from pre-19-teens-ish era and that's a, a Richard Traub motorcycle shop. Now this was on eBay, the photo, which was a total random scenario we get a phone call one day hey there's a photo on ebay you guys are really going to want to check out so we see it photos like that big we ended up buying it it's mounted on this little piece of cardboard like this no date no location anything like that so figuring out whether this was related at all to this bike was kind of a dead end for a very long time and then the two most recent pieces of information now we've got the richard trout guy here that was at 749 North Polina Street. This bike was found at a different address on Polina Street. And then this is a question and answer section where this fellow writes in and asks some questions about a twin cylinder motorcycle. Will a magneto ignition be practical for my twin with a bore of three and a half and a stroke of four inches geared at three to one, all these things that this bike is. And they ask how to keep the rear cylinder from over oiling. So, you know, when you look at a twin, as your crank spins this way, the rear cylinder gets all the oil. It's just the nature, it's cent centrifugally, that's what has the largest angle, the openings, the a larger opening. All sling, all sling back then. So he asked how to keep the rear cylinder from over oiling. And they give him this long answer, and it, I'll use like kind of modern terminology. Now they say install baffle plates. They didn't use the word baffle plate, but what a baffle plate is, uh, like if. Yeah, well, when you look at a lower end of an engine like this, uh, this here is a plate that's a, a part of the case. And yes. this one here has been broken out. This is a half plate. And what they do is keep that oil off of the cylinder walls. At this time, all you got is compression rings. You don't have oil control rings. So 
all with only compression rings, you foul out the top end real easy if you get too much oil. So they say, okay, you install baffle plates. Now Harleys were cast in. This guy says install baffle plates in order to get your desired amount of oiling, drill holes in those baffle plates. If you drill too many holes, plug them with brass pins. And when you look at the rebuild job, that's exactly, that's exactly what, what he did. Newly installed baffle plate, not cast into the case, holes drilled and then brass, brass pins paint. plug in about half of those holes. So that's from 1910, this article is. So it seems like you'd have been developing this thing before 1910. So then, then we find some census records where once we get this article and this guy signs it Richard Traub, no address or anything like that. But now we've got the name Richard Traub related to a motorcycle that happens to be three and a half by four geared at three to one with a mag ignition and baffle plates with holes drilled in brass. So it's like really at that point, it's like, all right, we think we know that Richard Traub is the guy that built this bike. So then we start doing census record research and we found a Richard Traub lived at 1520 Polina Street, different address than this. And, uh, lived there from the first census record we have is 1910, lived there all the way through 1954. So 1910, 20, 30, 40, 50, the guy lists himself as an experimental machinist, self-employed, perfect type of guy to do something like this. Um, so then we had the address and this photo here is a really neat deal is again with no information as to where the photo was, we start to wonder if this could be at 1520 Polina Street. So then a guy comes in with a fire insurance map from the Sanborn Company. And the Sanborn Company went to cities all over the country and made fire insurance maps. Okay, and this is, this is a small section of the map that he sent us. And this is Polina Street. This is a street that's now called Pierce Street. At this time in 1914, uh, which is when the map was made, uh, 1914, this is called West Keenan Street. So there's 1520 Polina Street. It's a corner lot. And on the back of the property, they've got machine shop scribbled in in this little building here. So at that point, we're thinking, you know what? I bet this building here, the little, it's like a little wood shed with Richard Traub, motorcycle shop, general repairing, just hand painted on there. We start to think, you know, this is probably the machine shop on the back. So what do you got nowadays for tools? You got things like Google Earth and Google Maps. And you can go to Google Earth and type the address in and hit Street View. And you're looking at the building. You're looking at what's there right now. So 1520 is a, a you know, house looks like it was probably built in the early 1900s. Uh, as you click and you walk down the street, down that Pierce Street, we were expecting to see this shop. And what's actually there now is like a two car brick garage that looks like it was built sometime in the 60s or 70s, which I always kind of figured maybe when they were tearing this down to build what's currently there is probably when they found this bike. And all that timeline kind of lines up now. So we were pretty bummed when you look at it, the two car garage, you know, and it's not what we were expecting to see, but what you do have in this photo, you can key in on the building next door. And when you're looking at the Google Earth deal now, and you look at the building next door to them two car garages, it's the exact same building, no doubt about it. So now we actually have a location to the photo. And then, so then we've got the kind of confusion on the two different addresses. There's the 749 address. The guy, like, you know, he, here's a homemade motorcycle built by myself through all. I worked on it between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. I also work Sundays. Runs as good as any four horsepower bike I know of. Lists all the specs. Rode at 1,500 miles and it hadn't troubled me yet. He signs at Richard Traub, 749 Polina Street. Or Richard Trout, right? So now that we figured out. Topo. Probably a typo. Or if you're looking here and you bring that little loop de loo far back, maybe it's a, a, a the, the guy reading it thinks it's a T. Yeah. So my dad's standard fallback answer was that they just changed the street. Ah, oh, they just changed the street numbers, you know, which sounds a little silly and far fetched. And then last year, the most recent piece of info that came to us is this. And this is the plan of renumbering City of Chicago, table showing old and new house numbers. And it's dated August 1909, which is in between the 1907 article and the 1910 census record. 
So 10 census record had him at 1520. 1907 Motorcycle Illustrated letter to the editor had him at 749. Not a far stretch. Well, and it's this document from when they changed it all is right in between those two times. So this is like a 150-page document. And in the in here, they've got this synopsis where they explain. They say, okay, prior to this date, street numbering in Chicago was totally chaotic, meaning you'd have like two parallel streets, and one would be like a north street, and the other one would be a west street, and this one would be five digits, and this one would be two digits on the same block, you know? So they basically make a system, and they say, okay, as of this date, you know, Madison and, and State Street are going to be the lines between east and west and north and south. We're going to do 800 numbers to a mile. It means every eighth of a mile, you got 100 numbers. It means every 20 feet is one number. So if you own 60 feet of street frontage, the guy next to you is going to be three numbers later. And that's all right in here. They, they set it out pretty specifically. And so then there's a full directory, every street in Chicago and what they changed from and what they changed it to. And you go to North Polina Street and you go down all the numbers and there's 749 North Polina Street was changed to 1520. Oh. So that was kind of the last piece of information that tied a lot of all this confusion together on the the two different addresses and the you know the who and the where and the when but the really odd you know the thing about it and for lack of any better way to put it i know it sounds a little cliche but why would you paint the mona lisa and stuff it under a staircase because it's effectively what he did is i mean this bike no joke could have changed the course of motorcycling and uh, instead, it sat behind a brick wall to 1967, years after the fella died. And what, you know, we know that he lived at the same address all the way through 1954. So this thing, like, he's sitting on the other side of the wall for 50, for 40 something years. The so thing is I it, can think of that would have changed was a divorce. He's never married. Uh, yeah, never married. Never had any kids. So in the 1910 and 20 census record, it says he lived with his mother, his brother, and his sister, but the guy was never married. And actually, we found some info uh, a little bit later on about him. He, post World War II, he was making telescopes, so that knack for precision yeah. was was there. But uh, it's kind of like an early super bike in its day. It's got a considerably more cubic inches. It's got an absolute ton of torque. It's got a really low center of gravity. One of the things that Harley did in 1916 is they inter introduced their Keystone racing frame, which loop frame bikes like this one, what you're doing is you're setting the motor really high in the frame. Loop frame being the loop tube coming down from out of the neck, loops down below the engine, back up to the seat post, just puts the motor in a naturally higher position. You know, these things are kind of long wheelbase, seat kind of high, tiller type bars point A to point B transportation, where this bike with the keystone frame, what the keystone frame is, and if you look close, you can you can really key in on it, but you've got a, a the, the front down tube here ends in front of the engine and the transmission cradle ends right behind the engine. The motor is actually a stressed member, so that allows you to drop the engine considerably lower. You don't have the loop tube on the bottom lower engine. You got a lower center of gravity lower center of gravity with a low motor. Now you can mount the seat lower. So it, it's about four inches off the ground now, but when you're sitting on this bike, when both wheels are on the ground, you can sit on it bent kneed. Your handlebars are really in a nice sporty position and it's kind of like the beginning of the sporting motorcycle. The transmission's another work of art. And you know, you've got the way we always put it is that the term modern motorcycle was redefined at numerous points throughout history. They'll come out with some new innovation and if you didn't adapt, you go out of business. So you get the, like the spring fork is one of those early things. This all starts as bicycles and with a bicycle you're going 10 mile an hour bouncing down the road and as soon as you get one of these big 500 cc single cylinder jobs that'll run you 30, 40, 45 miles an hour down the road, jarring your teeth out with a rigid front end, you know, was uh, going to be a limited thing. So spring fork comes around. If you don't adapt, you go out of business. Same thing with the transmission. About 1915, Harley, Indy, and Excelsior developed three-speed transmissions. And 
it really just changes the game entirely. If you can imagine everywhere you go, you got a belt drive, single speed, you know, the belt gets wet, you're not going anywhere, you're locked into one gear ratio, um, the belt stretches and you've got issues there. Um, same thing with a chain drive, you're locked into one gear ratio, so versatility is nil. You, you, you got to you know, prep your bike. If you're going to climb a hill, you prep it one way. If you're going to run 40 mile an hour down the road, uh, you prep it another way. The transmission changed all of that to where you can do it all on the same bike, on the same ride at the same time. So Harley Indian Excelsior spent cumulatively, cumulatively $700,000, $750,000 to develop their transmissions where this guy assumingly did it in his garage, you know, and it's a three speed transmission with two neutrals, uh, it works incredibly well and uh, complements the engine quite a bit. It's not a high RPM engine, but it makes a ton of torque and it will pull you down the road very, very well um, when you, well, let's fire this thing up. Enough of the long windedness, huh? This is a uh, really weird kick setup. And if any of you guys have had any, had any experience with some of the British bikes, the high compression overhead valve stuff, they've got a compression release that you pull when you kick start the bike. This is the only bike in the building as far as the, because everything in here is American made, the way they did it's a bit different. It's the only bike in here that you actually have to use the compression release to start the bike. And the way we crank it up is compression release is right here, it actually lifts the exhaust valves. So when you lift the exhaust valves, you can spin the motor over quite a bit easy, quite a bit more easily, and you we kind of give it like a three kicks to get that engine spun up to some amount of speed and drop the compression release, and it should fire right up.